name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saints Joachim and Anne, pray for us. Pray for us. Mary and Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brother Amen. in Christ, Lord day to Jesus Christus in sequela. This is Timothy Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to another edition of the Lay Apostolate on the Meaning of Catholic. Today I'm joined by my good friend and brother, Chris Plants. Chris, so happy to have you on. Always a pleasure. How you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm doing great, man. Trying to advance the, the kingship of Christ and... Uh, um yeah i'm glad to be back on man oh dude I, i'm so excited for your new channel which i want to ask you about in just a minute but first i told chris that he had a bible art quiz with our new intro so there's three pieces of art can you identify what these three pieces of art are it, it, and here's a hint one of them is non-bible um um the first one was, I think, the exile, leaving the, it was the exile. And Correct. Either, Destruction yeah. of the first temple. Yep. Yeah, exile. yeah, yeah. Okay. 586 BC. Um, there you go. <laughs> and then was it, uh, was it Mary? I think it might have been Mary's mom and dad. Ding, 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 no. ding, ding. It's, it's actually yeah. the, uh, it's, this or is no? Greek. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. But oh, okay, okay. This is Saints Joachim and Anne. Joachim and Anne. Parents yeah. of the Virgin Mary. And it's very, yeah. very important that this, so it's, it's St. Joachim and Anne kissing. And this is the Greek icon of the Immaculate Conception is what this is. Mm. So it, it's far more significant than just their fact that they're kissing. Obviously, this is, this is a chaste depiction of the Immaculate Conception. So it's a, obviously a significant moment in salvation history. But then uh, you could probably guess the, the third one, right? Uh, the third one was... Um... Well, initially I thought it was Augustine, but it wasn't because um, I don't know how it's. But is it God the Father? I, I don't know actually. Eh. I don't know who, no. Oh, oh, it's, no, no, it's um the Bible one. It's in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know actually. Oh, it's it's the betrothal of Mary and Joseph. Oh, Mary and Joseph. Okay, okay. It, it's it's so it's really confusing because the high priest has this weird hat that you don't recognize. It's like a miter with two right. points that kind of look devilish, honestly. Which so it's kind of weird looking at. But all the depictions that I found, they all have this high priest with the two horns there. So um, yeah, that's cool. But yeah, so th this this whole series is all, is about all things laity is what this is all about. So this is the series we talk about. Uh, all kinds of lay stuff. And this particular, this is the, the series within the series, which is the lay Catholic Bible reader. Uh, contrary to the popular Protestant narrative, the Catholic, as soon as the, even before the printing press, the Catholic church has always promoted lay people reading the Holy scripture. And uh, this is part of my book, introduction to the Holy Bible. Uh, but there's always been a promotion of, of lay people reading the Holy scripture and this is part of our whole uh, lay apostle. This is what we do. We read the entire Bible uh, every year as a part of our Fellowship of St. Anthony, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But today we're going to talk about St. Paul Catholic Theologian. But before all of that, Chris, tell us about your new channel. You've got yeah. new things going on. And I'm very excited about it. Tell us what's what's new with Chris Plants. Yeah, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. So, um, yeah, I started this YouTube channel. Um, I had thought about it, you know, over the last several years, and other people were trying to encourage me to do it. Um, but it seemed to be the right time uh, for several reasons. Um, and um, so the channel is um, based around what I what I describe as three highways, the story of the Bible, the mission of the church, and the politics of the world. And I basically explore at my at, at my channel what it's like to sit at the intersection of those three highways: the story of the Bible, the mission of the church, the politics of the world. Um, and so I I veer off from it a little bit. Like for example, when I whenever I have uh, like I had Richard DeClue on, and uh, we were talking about Benedict the Sixteenth, and of course that that does actually. Um, 
link up with a couple of those highways. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I like to try to bring, um, the, the challenge is this is like, I have, I have obviously a lot to say in my Bible studies and everything on scripture, but a lot of people want to know how does it actually apply? Like whatever Paul says to the Ephesians, you know, or the Romans or what Matthew is, uh, is, is saying in his gospel, how does this actually apply to our lives here and now? So I'm trying to, um, yeah, trying to explore the, what it's like to sit at the intersection. And of course it is going to get political as, as you know, um, I read the story as the story of scripture as being about the reign of Christ, uh, in heaven and on earth. Um, and I see the lay vocation and the vocation of the clergy um, united, uh, distinct distinct from each other, but as one. So I see the clergy as ambassadors. Actually, if you scroll to the right there, you can see one of my recent ones. <clears throat> um, the bishops as ambassadors, laity as rulers, and Christ as king. And in that, you know, I'm, I'm exploring this idea of... You know, Jesus makes these these promises to his apostles that they're going to sit on thrones, and uh, and uh, and it we're, we assume that he was right that they do sit on thrones. But how do they sit on thrones? And then, um, and the very fact that they're not interpreted as like Paul is going to say something to Caesar in Rome, but he doesn't seem to be looking to like usurp Caesar's vocation as a lay as what would hopefully be a, as a lay catholic he seems to be he describes himself in the ephesians as an ambassador so i explore a little bit like what would that what did ambassador look what did an ambassador do in the ancient world how would paul be identifying himself as an ambassador and then kind of see that as the vocation of the clergy as the of the bishops and the pope and then um and then how do the laity fit into all that so that's just one example and then um you know we're going to get into i have a couple response videos. I have a response video to Glenn Beck um, and uh, coming up and a response video to the little Nas, situ the, the blasphemous video that he did. Right. And just responding and saying, how can Catholics in light of the story of scripture and the mission of the church, how should we respond to, um, uh, to certain people saying certain things in the, in the here and now? So that's, that's the channel. Well, like I said, you, I, I was, I, I love your response videos because, uh, in my view, uh, your responses are so powerful and Christian in their method and content that this is, this is something there where I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're doing what you're doing and you're doing more of it. I, I wanted to, uh, actually <laughs> so funny. I, I, I have, this is, this is my book. But I, 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 and I wanted to just pull this up really quick because to tell people if you've never heard of Chris Plants, uh, let's see. This is, I was trying to find this footnote where I mentioned you. It's like, uh, oh, yeah, it's Kingdom of God. Much of the, the next few, few pages are based on Christopher Plants. Oh, here we go. Footnote 9, page 52. The following section is influenced by the explication contained in the forthcoming volume by Christopher Plant's Kingdom by Creation. And I'll, I'll say this because when we first met Chris, we did a show called The uh, the Kingship of Christ as the Essence of the Gospel. And it, it was it was very similar to my experience reading Scott Hahn's dissertation covenant uh, on the covenant because that, that dissertation was like a... <laughs> a huge TNT and my whole understanding of scripture that everything had just illuminated in a new way. It was the same thing with you, Chris. It, it was when you, when you explained this to me, it was like everything made sense again in the scripture. Like I, I thought I understood the scripture, but suddenly boom, what you put down. So here's my question. When is the book coming out, Chris? Oh my goodness. I mean, <laughs> look, the, so I, so I had, um, I had a, a deal with a publisher um, and I can't really reveal too much, uh, right now, but, um, but, uh, we'll see, we'll see what happens. It might, I might have to pitch it to a new publisher. Um, okay. so, uh, well, the book, uh, book is coming someday. God willing. Yeah, no, it will. Someday. I mean, it's done. It's, it's done. And actually we'll, we'll see. I might just, uh, publish it, um, you know, on my, on my own. What do they call that? Uh, self-published. Uh, yeah. So yeah, self-published. So, um, 
or honestly, if it's taking so long, if it's taking too long, I might just uh, put it in some sort of ebook. And if people want it, mm -hmm. you know, they can email me or whatever. Um, but no, I mean, it's it's like Scott Hahn. You're right. Scott Hahn's book, Kinship by Covenant, um, is really important. And I think that all I would want to do is add like a G at the end of like kingship by covenant because oh, what yeah. we see what we see uh covenants creating um is um co covenants are creating these royal allegiance uh, these yeah. communities of royal allegiance to god as king and in fact first samuel opens up with this idea that the the people of israel don't want it they don't they they don't want god as king they want a human yeah. king so eventually god solves that by becoming human and himself becoming king you know um and uh, yeah, I think it's really important. I think that this is a very sensitive, what I go around talking about is very sensitive. I think it's very difficult because as soon as you say the gospel is political, all sorts of things can go haywire in people's right. minds. And so, but also saying it forcefully. Um, I think Paul had to explain exactly what it means for Christ to become king. And it was also dangerous for him. You know, he was misunderstood a lot and obviously got his head chopped off, not merely because he... He said, you know, hey, put Jesus up as another God among all the other gods. It's because he told Caesar that Caesar's actually now subject to him, to uh, should be subject to Christ. So, um, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I really have been encouraged by your 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 response to um, what I'm bringing out, especially with the ascension, kind of put, putting an emphasis oh, yeah. on that in the last uh, several years. You know, and trying to get Catholics, not just to put the resurrection back in the Paschal mystery, but also the ascension back in the Paschal mystery. Because typically the formula, the technical formula that has been passed down from ages now is the Paschal mystery is the passion, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord. But recently it's just been the passion and death of our Lord. But it's supposed to be passion, death, and resurrection. But then... It was only, you know, several years ago that I I was like, you know, I keep trying to put the res resurrection back, but the ascension is actually the final moment where Christ is crowned as ruler of heaven and earth. Um, and then once you get that from the gospels and acts, and then you start following Paul and you're like, wait, wait, Paul's saying the exact same thing, actually, you know, and I've also been encouraged by Bishop Barron, you know, Bishop Barron, one of my response videos to Bishop Barron. And Bishop Barron has picked this up too. I think we might be reading some of the same scholars. And it's like when Jesus says, Jesus Kyrios, Jesus is Lord, like he understood the implications of that and the and the danger yeah. that came with that. So, yeah, we're going to get into that in just a minute. Just So uh, real quick, this is our annual Bible reader. If you want to join our Bible reading program, this is you read the Bible, every the entire Bible in a year with a liturgical focus so everything is based on the ancient liturgies where the liturgy or the bible was read in matins but there's a penance requirement you cannot approach the holy fire of the word of god unless you're doing extra penances beyond what the church requires because we have to purify ourselves with humility before we can really get into this but uh this is what's going on right now in epiphany tie we read saint paul that's traditional because it's the message to the Gentiles. He's the apostle to the Gentiles, and Epiphany is celebrating the manifestation to the Gentiles in particular, especially in the Roman rite. But then uh, Septuagesima is a great time to jump into the Bible reader because that's when Genesis begins. So Septuagesima happens on January 28th this year. It's the three-Sunday prep time before Lent, and that's when the church traditionally would begin in Matins reading Genesis. So they go all the way through Genesis, through the Pentateuch, and then into Paschal Tide. They're going through uh, Judges, Joshua, and then into after after Trinity in the time after Pentecost, aka over ordinary time. That's when you go through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, into Chronicles, etc. So it's a great time to jump into the Bible reading. Uh, you can click the link below. You can take a look at the penance requirements. Promise, I promise, it's not too difficult, but it is above the church requirement. That's the requirement to join the Bible reading program. So. Uh, this so with that i'm going to start with some questions from our bible reading group to prompt you to explain i know we're going to get into a lot of the kingship of christ here um but before we do uh, sort of a general question is um would you recommend any particular books on saint paul chris before we <laughs> we've already promoted your forthcoming book 
what books would you recommend on St. Paul? Okay, so let me let me say a few disclaimers. So I think that there are a lot of good books out there. Um, I won't recommend a lot of the books that I have behind me just because they're not perfect and they can easily confuse if you don't know sort of what you're going in to, to look for. But I will say, even if I'll, I will recommend some books, but there's nothing that can take the place of sort of what you were just saying, which is just reading the Bible. And um, there are a lot of good introductions out there, but it cannot replace just reading the Bible over and over and over and over again. Remember, the, the communities that first read the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, Paul's letters, the, the church in Rome, they didn't have the introductions and the different books behind me. What they did have, though, were the scrolls of the Old Testament. And they saw it as like um, like a an episode uh, or a series, uh, uh, um, a TV show, you know, where you start off with this, this is the plot line, and then it, the, the story just goes, and then it picks up, you know, towards the end with Paul's letters, you know, and um, and so there, so just that I'm going to recommend some books, but just remember that you already have. A lot of it done if you're just reading the Bible over and over and over again. Start with Genesis and just slowly work your way all the way through. And when you're done, do it again. Do it again. And every time you do it, you'll pick up on something something new. Now, <clears throat> there aren't a lot of – oh, let me recommend also the uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. Oh, okay, yeah. this isn't what it looks like. This is my uh, – this is my – I rebound it. Yeah. But the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible is – is really really good. I'd recommend it. Um, and and just getting those footnotes, like the the footnotes are really there. There's enough in here to keep you busy. Yeah, there it is. Yep. Yeah. So there's enough in there to keep you busy. So I just I would make sure you have that Bible. Um, there are some other good Catholic translations out there that the Augustine Institute's putting out, but they don't have like a commentary. A, a commentary. Um, and, uh, let's see. Um, oh, I want to recommend this book. Now it's not really an introduction, but it's a handy book and it's called commentary on the, uh, new Testament use of the old. Okay. By GK Beale and DA Carson. They're Protestants, but basically what they do is they, what it's, it's what they, um, uh, they do in the Ignatius Catholic study Bible, where they give you references to different old Testament passages that are being pulled from pulled by Paul from the old Testament and used, and they just give you more text to look up. Okay. So it's sort of like a, a, a map. It doesn't have the answers, but it shows you where to look in the old Testament. Oh, Paul's c citing Psalm 68. And then it gives you a little bit too about, Oh, why did he, you know, why do scholars think that he, um, yeah, wrote, wrote Psalm 68 in this way by, by changing a few of the words or whatever. So, um, it's really good. Uh, um, uh, that's a really good resource. I would say I'm going to a couple Catholic authors. Okay. That I would recommend, um, Paul, a new covenant Jew. Okay. This is by, uh, you'll see there, John Kincaid, Brant Petrie, Michael Barber, rethinking Pauline theology forward by Michael Gorman. Um, it's a really good book. Uh, I have made my way almost through it, uh, about three quarters of the way through, and it's really good. Um, it's good. All three of these uh, Catholic guys are scholars uh, and good, faithful Catholics. Um, it's a really good introduction. It also gets you up to date a little bit about the scholarship and um, – and, um, yeah. I mean, they're all also, they're all students, former students of Scott Hahn. So they're, they're reading Paul through that covenant lens that, that, that Scott taught all of us to, to keep front and center as we're reading the new Testament. Yes. Chris so, is also a former student of Scott Hahn. Yeah. If, if people didn't right. Know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then there's another, there's another book I'd recommend, um, by James Prothro. Okay. And this is a book that I'm just kind of getting, I'm not really familiar with his, I haven't been too familiar with his, uh, his work, but Michael Barber had recommended him. And I'm really impressed because 
one of the things he gets into is the topic of justification, which I think you guys wanted to get into a little bit today. And he he sort of makes the case that, look, there is that legal language there. Um, and he's saying, you know, we we can we can perform a synthesis, as I understand him. I'm not all the way through his his text, but we can perform a synthesis between the participatory aspects of Paul's language, right? Like being in Christ, participating, a very Eastern theosis, right? And also the legal language that is characterized justificatio in the in the Latin West tradition, right? Something that Thomas and um Anselm and then picked up in Calvin that that emphasis on the legal uh language. And so he performs he's just doing a doing his Catholic thing, right? But it's published by uh Cascade Books and it's a really good book. I think he graduated. Yeah, he is the assistant professor of scripture and theology at Augustine Institute. And uh, I think he I think he got his doctorate at Oxford. So smart dude. Um it's a good book so far. Maybe those those are a couple books. Um they're a little bit dense. Um they're not really an introduction. Yet, but I would just say a good introduction is the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I I love the Study Bible. I can't wait for the full version to come out. Everybody, everybody in our group is just dying for it to come out, including myself. I know the Old um, Testament one. So, yeah, or just the. I know they're they're publishing individual books, but I, I'm just I'm I'm excited for the full yeah. thing to come out eventually. Okay, well, so I I, yeah. I should also say there's the um there's the Catholic commentary on Scripture. Um, have yeah. you heard of that? Uh, they're no, out no. of, um, I think, uh, Baker Academic. Um, oh, Baker see. Academic. Okay. Yeah, Let's Baker see. Academic. Let me see. Uh, yeah. So th those books, the, the the Catholic Commentary on Scripture series, is also pretty good. Pretty good introduction. And okay. I think Scott Hahn did the one on the on Paul's letter to the Romans. Oh, great. Okay. Um, yeah. It's so. I mean, it, it's funny that there's there's like. Uh, I think there's good Catholic and there's actually, as you said, there's good Protestant, um, especially like I, I really appreciate the Protestant scholarship. Uh, what I tell people is that um, when Protestants are just talking about what the Bible says and not what it means, that's when it's everything they're doing. They're just making these connections between these different verses and, and telling about historical background and archaeology and all this stuff. All that stuff is great. But thank you, separated brethren, for doing all this work on our book let's now join the catholic church but anyways but as soon as they start to draw all these doctrines out of the scripture that's when we start to wade into deep into you know messy heretical territory obviously but there's a lot of great good that the protestants have out there that catholic can draw from um but mm -hmm. here's here's some of our questions from our bible group um so you you wanted to talk on the subject chris of saint paul as the Catholic theologian. And so here's some of the prompting questions, and I, I'm sure that Christ the ki Christ's kingship will be central in all of this. Um, but uh, w one question is, which epistle is the best place for a non-scholar to start to help to learn, appreciate St. Paul? Obviously, he wrote a ton of epistles. Um, and what about the development of his theology of salvation through his epistles? Um, you know, scholars debate which one was the first one and there's also an ordering to the scripture which i'm not sure if that if the ordering of of the epistles came after the liturgy because the liturgy itself orders them that way the the matins liturgy that we're following in this bible group um and why does saint paul lay so much emphasis on faith rather than faith and good works obviously that's the main protestant contention about saint paul and then saint james seems to make such a big deal out of faith and works so why why does this why does saint paul do this so help us understand saint paul catholic theologian go ahead yeah so one of the cases that i i'd like to make on my channel and and what what i had proposed to you was that saint paul was the first catholic theologian that that really he really is he really does set the stage for everything that's going to come after um because he he's he's writing if you know if he writes galatians first who you know i we there's some there's some uh wiggle room as to when he wrote certain books you know we don't know exactly but when you compare what we can gather from the individual texts themselves and then also gather from his own um 
or from Acts from Acts of the Apostles with what he writes in his letters, you can start to, you know, put them together and say, oh, okay, he wrote, you know, he wrote Romans probably when he was on his way to Corinth. Um, and he probably wrote, you know, second Corinthians around that same time. He wrote first Corinthians, obviously when he was in Ephesus, Ephesus prior on the way. So I do, yeah, it's interesting as to how they got in the order that they, you know, that they were eventually placed in with Romans coming first after acts. But I think to step back and look at the man himself, this is a man that had, um, he, he was a Pharisee. Um, he was someone that we know from his letters was, thoroughly committed to the God of Israel. And he loved this God. He loved the God of Israel. He loved Yahweh. And he never really gave up on that. He never gave up on loving the God that had revealed himself to Moses, the God who had revealed himself to Abraham. Um, we also know that, that he was, he had dual citizenship. So he grew up in Tarsus. Right. So technically Asia minor, right before you drop down into uh, Judea, you know, he's up there and Tarsus, remember, like from Strabo and other first century authors, uh, historians, um, they they tell us that that Tarsus is the number one philosophy department in the world. OK, it's no longer Athens. Athens and Alexand Alexandria have both been eclipsed by Tarsus. And we we know from the some of the historians that say that what Tarsus did is they 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 got some of their men who were good philosophers and then then they didn't ship their boys off to Athens or Alexandria they just kept they didn't ship them off they just kept them there and so they built this sort of faculty this philosophy faculty department that just grew and grew and grew and it eclipses in the first century both Athens and Alexandria now that's important why well because Paul's a boy. He's a young boy. He's growing up. And, and as he's hanging out with his friends, they're all influenced by the world's greatest philosophers at this time in Tarsus. So, so Paul, Paul, we know that he went down to get formal training in Jerusalem. And so he never budged on his, uh, allegiance to, there you go. Yeah. You can see it right there. <clears throat> And he never budged in his allegiance to the God of Israel. But you can imagine that with that dual citizenship and then a bunch of what, you know, we can imagine him having friends and being influenced in some ways with Greco-Roman Greco philosophy, that he's sort of the perfect guy that God would want to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, right? Because he... Rather than someone who's just living in Jerusalem, he knows what it's like to be part of the diaspora, to be a Jew living in the Roman Empire under the big thumb of Rome, but also living outside of um, living outside of, of of Jerusalem, but also still connected to his own Jewish heritage, um, and believing that God would in time. Yeah, there you go. Nice. Yeah, you can see Tarsus up there in the right little mid right hand corner Tars is there so he would drop down and go to Jerusalem uh to go receive formal training um we know that you know he had studied under Gamaliel who's a great rabbi of the time one of the greatest rabbis of the time so i think you know and he was very zealous for the law he's continuing in the Phineas tradition right of very zealous and he sees himself putting the blade to the necks of catholic women and men he sees himself as just doing the right. This is what righteousness is. Yeah, Phineas. That's, that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And he sees himself as imitating Phineas as, as basically like, this is what righteousness good. God, God was pleased. God is pleased by me killing these Catholics. And I think, I think God in his great mercy, you know, Pope Francis talks about the extent to which God's mercy can go. And it's scandalous sometimes. I mean, imagine how scandalous, you know, imagine taking someone who is a murderer, who who admits, not trying to cover it up, but admits to being a murderer, making him not only a bishop, and then making him one of the pillars on which the church is going to be founded. And on top of that, he's writing almost two thirds of the New Testament. This guy was a murderer. Um, and so I think that 
um, you know, as Paul describes it, he thinks that that just is his own conversion is a revelation of God's, the extent of God's love and grace. And obviously God has converted murderers down through the church's history. Um, but Paul is um, on his way to Damascus. He has his conversion. And remember, Paul knew all of, the, he, he knew for the most part, the claims that Stephen and the first Catholics were making, right? Like, okay, this guy is claiming to be the Messiah born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem. They're trying to pull all these passages from the Old Testament. <clears throat> and Paul isn't, Paul isn't having it. You know, I'm sure Paul sat there listening and was like, yeah, this doesn't really make sense. So what ends up happening, it seems, and this is how we can kind of get at this question of him as a theologian. And is that <clears throat> in the, you know, in the algebra textbooks, when we were going to school, how you had the answers in the back of the book, this is a way that I describe it for my students at my school. Cause they use this, actually the same algebra books that I was, I was using. <laughs> um, and, uh, not the, the new, uh, new stuff, whatever they put out, but the, the answers are in the back. And you can go and check your answers, right? And it's helpful with math so that if you get the answer wrong, you know that you can go back and rework the formula. That That's a great analogy for what Paul's given. So Paul isn't really given the questions, the right questions to ask, interpretations of the text. He's given the answer. You know, so he you imagine God as a teacher writing the answer on the board. And then what, so on the road to Damascus, he's given the answer that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is Israel's Messiah. He can't deny his own eyes, that his own eyes saw Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ identifies himself with his body, the church, and is the Messiah. He's alive. Paul believed that Jesus was alive. He was still alive, breathing, you know, there with them, in with the community. The spirit plays a huge part in all that as well. But then he goes back and in his letters, he reworks the formula. He, he's, he's doing exactly what the kids in algebra class do. He, he puts, he plugs in the answer on the other side of the equal sign. And then he rereads passages of the old Testament that he had been reading and had been taught to read for so long and then reworks them, um, and sees Jesus in the middle of them, in, in the middle of all these passages. Um, and so I think that he is, he is really, I mean, his, his, his letters are the earliest writings we have. I think he is like the first theologian that goes and does Catholic theology, which for him amounted to going back and seeing how Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of a story that began at creation, um, that is contextualized by sin and a failure of human vocation to rule the earth on God's behalf. And then picked up again with the promises made to Abraham, right? His own great, 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 great grandfather, right? Um, and and so he, so 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 yeah, he he works it all in. And I think what's so interesting too is what he's doing is part of reformulating the equation is reformulating the way that he and his fellow Jews were understanding the promises made to Abraham. Cause, cause the promises, um, the promises made to Abraham in Genesis 12 pick up and are sort of described as the counter to what had just happened in the scattering with the scattering of the nations in Genesis 11. So the scattering of the nations happens and then God makes these promises to, to Abraham. And then he says, and we're talking about blessings, right? God is going to you going to bless the nations through Abraham. So what Paul saw God doing is he's going to bring all of the nations back together in and through Abraham's family. So, so in other words, it's not the equation, the way he was wording it, because when Jesus is going up to the North and you've got some Canaanite woman, right? Who's saying, yeah, we want scraps that fall from the master's table. Or when he's going to, to Gentiles, right? Soldiers, right? And he's he's announcing the gospel. It's like, well, how does that fit into the election that is Israel? And Paul says, actually, it fits in perfectly if you read Genesis 12 in light of Genesis 11, which is that the whole purpose of God setting Israel apart was so that through them, they would br they would they would bring all of the nations under God's sovereign reign. And, and he does mean that politically, 
Okay. He means Saul that Jerusalem is going to be the place from which through the wisdom, through the, the wisdom that is Torah and, and, you know, Solomon's wisdom, the queen of the South will come up, right? The nations will come in and, and gather and they'll be like, Whoa, this guy has a lot of wisdom. Who, who, you know, who is his God? And they're like, it's Yahweh. And then all the nations convert to Yahweh, right? That's, that was, that was the ideal. The problem is, is Solomon's given wisdom, but he's also foolish, right? He accumulates wives contrary to Deuteronomy 17, 17. Um, he just falls in his, his, his dad's footsteps. And then it just gets worse from there and spirals out of control with, um, uh, with his sons. And then the kingdom is split. And then the king, and then in 722, his entire family is scattered and, and then you have the prophets talking about, well, there's going to be a messianic figure that's going to unite them. And then you get, and then you get to the first century and you're like, nobody even knows where they are. And Paul sees that Jesus provides the answer in the blessing breaking, uh, giving to his uh, bishops and then the bishops giving the bread to the people. That was the moment in which all of the nations come together and, and, uh, accomplish this worldwide reign of God reversing um, the consequence of sin. And therefore these people are now the ones that are going to rule the world on God's behalf. The, remember at the end of Genesis, the scepter will not depart from you, Judah. Right. Yeah. So anyways, th th this is Paul, like, this is what I mean by like, could you give us a, could you give us a, a introduction to Paul? I'm like, look, a lot of the books back there are, are going to get you to focus on something like the best thing is to just read through the story and imagine if it's a TV series. Look how many people out there that I don't watch TV series really. I don't have time. I don't have time for that. But <clears throat> if you do, you talk to some of them, they're like, oh my gosh, this happened in a season one, episode two. How do you know season one? Oh, it's called they know the title of it, they know the characters in the story. And then you get all the way to season 13. And <laughs> yeah. season 13 is like they they go back and read it a second time. Um and, or they go back and watch it a second time and now they're seeing everything in light of it. And so what I'm suggesting is, you know, what if someone said, well, okay, let's say there's a, there's a show on you. There's a show on what are streaming service? Yeah. Someone says, Hey, is there a book that I can read to, to, to get an introduction to the show? And <laughs> what if they're like, well, just instead of doing the introduction, cause it's from someone's perspective, why don't you just Re, why don't you just watch the show all 13 episodes and then we can talk about it and then I can give you recommend some books. So that's kind of my thing is just like, yeah, yeah. remember, they just see a big story happening. And I think Paul sees the story happening. But when he get he gets to episode, he gets to season 13 final episode and he's like, oh, it was <laughs> it, it was Jesus. It was Jesus all along. The whole thing in ep in season three, episode five, when Moses sees God, you know, glimpses God's face, it was Jesus. And you're like, whoa, 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 what? And Paul's like, yes, I saw the final episode on the road to Damascus. <laughs> the final ep season 13, episode five, episode, uh, you know, 17 or whatever. It was Jesus. And then you go back and you go to back to season three and you're like, he's like, yeah, when all these prophets saw God's face, Elijah, they saw Jesus. They were like brought forward in time or whatever, um, or they were something. Paul Paul thinks that it was Jesus. That So then Paul, and obviously John does this as well, thinks that the image that we were in fact made in is the second person of blessed Trinity. So this is those are just some examples of how Paul looks back at certain passages in the Old Testament and, and sees Jesus in light of it. So it's, so it's, it's the story of Israel, the story of creation that he's telling. And then he, once he places Jesus in there, he sees Jesus making the whole thing come together and, and being okay. this one united thing. So it sounds like story. if you, if you could speak to this, um, it sounds like <laughs> the faith and works thing is about, if you put that in the context of the promises of Israel, because they're all talking, James and St. Paul are both talking about Abraham justified by his works and faith. They're thinking about how do we, how do we, the, you know, the Phineas and the Pharisees are trying, how do we bring about the promises of Israel in Genesis yes. 12, et cetera? 
it's by following the law as perfectly as possible because that's how we got kicked out of the promised land in the first place. And he, yes. he exiled us, brought us back. Uh, we're just going to keep this law perfectly and then it'll bring about the promises is what the Pharisees think. And that's what St. Paul thought. And now he's bring, bringing everything through Jesus. Now, before you get to that, though, I want to find add this jump on this um, additional question, which I thought was so brilliant. Um, what is Chris's thoughts on moving away from the tendency to approach St. Paul as a systematic theologian and instead approach him as a mystic? If he'd recommend reading as mystical theologian, it goes back to the book. But I thought that was a, a great question because this is kind of where we get into the Protestants a lot because they want to go into like, John Kelvin's Institute's systematic theology and a lot of these, uh, you know, these newer or so-called Orthodox Presbyterian guys are into that sort of thing. But when you read St. Paul or you read Book of Acts, St. Paul is talking so much about his own experience of Almighty God, uh, his experience of Jesus, which is mystical. And then in Second Corinthians, he goes into a bunch of mystical stuff. Um, so, yeah, if you could speak to the faith and works and speak to the mysticism. Yeah, I mean, Paul was caught up into the third heavens, right? Yeah. And and saw God's face to face. Now, Paul's Paul begins as a theologian, as a mystic, right? Um, because of this experience that he has with Jesus. Now, there are some scholars that um, uh, that have suggested, and I actually have one of the books here, right here. I'll show it in a second. That have suggested that, um that Paul was actually doing Merkaba meditation, Merkaba mysticism um, while he was on his way to Damascus. So his description, mm -hmm. some scholars say his descriptions of being blinded is really descriptions of what we see with Moses and Elijah. And how with the Pharisees, Mer how do you spell Merkaba? M E R M E R K A B A H. Merkaba mysticism and Merkaba are just, I think the wheels on the throne chariot on God's throne chair, you know, Ezekiel okay. sees the chariot. And what you do is you try the Pharisees tried to, they tried to imitate Moses and Elijah and the great old Testament figures that had seen God face to face. And, and they, they tried to get to that. And so they'd start with meditating on the wheels of Golgolan right? That's one of, actually, I wanted to have a title of, of a book called The Wheels of Gogolon, uh, you know, Paul's <laughs> mystical theology. But you start with the wheels, and then you slowly work your way, you know, wheels with all the eyes and the, you know, and, and you know, the, the depictions of the prophets in the Old Testament, trying their best to understand, you know, God's holy presence. But you start, you start with the wheels, and you slowly work your way up, and you meditate on the meanings of all this. And then hopefully the Pharisees really believed that you could, like Moses, get up and and get a glimpse of the face of God, the beatific vision, right? Just as we say, it's 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 some saints have gotten close, right? In in our in in the Catholic tradition. So what scholars believe was happening was Paul was he because he describes it in a um, a Moses Elijah type way afterwards that he himself is walking on his road to Damascus doing Merkaba myst a mystical meditation, which is something that is very common. And he would have been doing if he, if he wasn't texting or tweeting, he was meditating, you know, on the throne chariot. And I think <clears throat> as one scholar put it, you know, he's meditating and, and finally he, he gets up beyond the wheels and, and he, he sees God face to face and it's the face of Jesus of Nazareth. So in a single moment, like he had been reading the story, thought it was going a certain way and it wasn't, but at the same time he got the answer. He actually saw the face of God in the face of Christ, in the face of Jesus. So, so, you know, the, the idea that he was doing Merkaba mysticism makes sense. And Merka, and the Merkaba mysticism, this is a really good book. It's super dense, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for everyone. But it's called uh, Messiah and Throne. So Jewish Merkaba mysticism and early Christian exaltation discourse. Okay. So it's intimately linked with, um, with uh, 
with God being enthroned, right? Because when you get up to the face of God, you're meditating not just on his throne, his, you're meditating on his throne chariot. You're meditating. So the royal and mystical dimensions are intimately linked in, 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 uh, you know, this, this, uh, this sort of this type of meditation, right? So, so when Paul goes on in his letters to describe Christ as King, and he does this in many different ways, right? He's just doing mysticism, and 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 you'd say, you know, some people say, well, no, he's doing political theology. If anything, Chris, like if you're right about this, he's doing political theology. And it's like, well, in the way he was thinking about it, is like he his mysticism is all about this royal ideology, this royal theology of God sitting on top his throne ruling the world, um, through Jesus and the church. And so, you know, I think too, like, like even when he, in Ephesians, he thinks the Ephesians are currently ruling. So pulling from Daniel seven, Daniel seven has, Daniel has the vision, right? He too has the vision. He sees the throne set up. He sees Yahweh, he sees the son of man sitting in his right hand and he sees the holy ones all sitting there enthroned. And what do they do? They open the books by which the the nations are judged. And Paul in his, you can think about in his meditation thinks that the Ephesians are the ones sitting on the throne. And this is why it makes sense. Why he thinks that he says the line, like, don't you know, you Catholic lady are going to judge angels. We're like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. judge? Like, how are we going to, he think he actually thinks we're currently enthroned in heaven with the Messiah. And we are now reading the verdict of the books that have been opened up according to Daniel seven through Daniel nine. And so this is why I think he thinks that we can go to nations and say, not only do you need to be subject to Christ, the King, but that's unlawful. The, you know, like the Cristero martyrs were saying the Cristero martyrs were doing the Daniel seven thing. Paul would say by condemning the Marxist communists and said, look, we're the holy ones of Daniel seven. You don't get to judge. We judge you. And you have been found wanting. Okay. That's why we can't go along with this. That's why we are launching this internal rebellion against you because we're the ones that have authority according to the son of man. Um, I think that's how Paul would probably read the whole Cristero event according to, you know, the way he's reading <laughs> Ephesians. So he would say, look, Catholics ought to be ruling. Why? Because, oh, because we just trust ourselves more. It was like, not really. I mean, look at the kind of mess this Catholic laity are, right? Um, but Believe it or not, despite all this, and this is one of my videos, I re recent videos I did, Paul knows that Demas had left him. Paul knows that at Hymenaeus and Alexander had made shipwreck of their souls. He knows the church in Corinth is a mess. But somehow he writes his captivity epistles, still thinking and still asking them for prayers so that he can boldly tell Caesar to his face, Jesus Christ is Lord. So he is say, well, Paul, you can't do that because you know the Catholic laity are a mess. He's like, no, 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 no. This isn't a Catholic laity thing. This is a Holy Spirit thing. And he is bringing about the reign through the Holy Ones, the, the Catholics, through Catholics. And um, and he's going to get on with that, even if Hymenaeus and Alexander and Demas are are have fallen away from the faith or have made shipwreck of their faith. So so um so I think that Paul. Paul's entire theology is rooted in his mysticism as a mystic, um, this experience with God. He takes this experience and he applies it, right? And it's not always helpful to just apply your own experience to theology, right? Because that can end up in all sorts of, you yeah, know, right. but Paul was specifically inspired and the church had commissioned him. Peter had commissioned him. So we're good. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I, just like normal, Chris, I, I'm, totally blown away so excited to get back to my saint paul reading this is this this is fantastic I, I everybody do yourself a favor go subscribe to chris plants channel and uh i'm just so excited I, I always get excited when i'm talking to you about the holy scripture i mean this is this is awesome i i, yeah. I was just as you were saying that well side note i should i should say if you google maricaba meditation you're going to get a bunch of Kabbalah, whatever sort of thing. Don't try this at home, kids. Seriously, you're going to get demon possessed or something. That's not good because, uh, yeah. you know, what what Jews or various others do, if they're doing this sort of meditation without Christ, bad things can happen. But I, I you're what you're making a very good point that there there was all this mysticism and things going on before Christ and entering into that. But I think that that's. It's an incredible yeah, don't don't go search. Yeah, don't go yeah, searching don't try for this. But 
Um, yeah, we're talking pure like history and and more scholarship stuff. But like Paul, just all of our meditation as Catholics is just flowing from that that flowing from New Testament, fr flowing from the New Testament. So just stick with the saints: Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesu, John of the Cross, all the saints. Stick with them. Don't go looking for you know. You, and you don't need to meditate on the throne chariot of Ezekiel's vision. Just meditate on the face of Christ. You know, meditate on the incarnation. That's what Paul would recommend. Paul said, look, all those things were just pointing forward to Christ. But once he's come, pick up your rosary yeah. and meditate on the incarnation. Meditate on the ascension. Meditate on, you know, don't, don't, don't overcomplicate it. Yeah, it's a good, it's a, yeah. that's a good point. I, so I, I just um, well, what, as you were saying that I was thinking about the rosary and I was thinking about the 15 decade. If you do like the 15 decade continuously, it starts with the incarnation and, and climaxes with the coronation of Mary. And that uh, parallels the crown of thorns parallels the and then the ascension. Of course, there's so much enthronement going on in the whole the whole rosary so we don't have any more time we gotta we gotta close out I, i'm so excited to uh as i said go go to chris's channel um thanks so much chris let's let's pray hail mary and invoke our our patron here mary queen of the home uh this is this is our academy you can go to mediumofcatholic.com slash academy the homeschool uh for high schoolers that's over at avila institute we've got two classes going right now Chris actually he taught a Bible study last year for Mary Queen of the Home Academy, um, but Mary Queen of the Home is our primary patroness for our domestic church part of our apostolate. Uh, so we're going to invoke Mary Queen of the Home to help us in our Bible reading, and we'll also, of course, invoke Saint Paul. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Queen of the Home. Pray for us. St. Paul, Catholic theologian. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.